you so much for this opportunity that we get to study your word together. Uh, we're so grateful for uh, the ability that we can live in a country where we can do this legally. And I pray, Lord, that you will just protect everyone here and uh, um, just from illness and sickness and those who are sick, I pray for healing for them, Lord. Uh, I pray that tonight it won't be me speaking, but it'll be you speaking. And I pray for accountability because this is just as much a learning experience for me as it is for people that I'll be talking to and who uh, we'll be conversing together with. So I pray, Lord, that you be the leader tonight and that you be the one to direct the words that come out of my mouth and other people's mouths. Uh, thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity and for these people. And uh, in your name I pray. Amen. All right. So without further ado, um, do you guys, I know we kind of were talking about it earlier, but can anyone just give me a brief summary of what Ongerth talked about last week? Anybody? Is that Bob raising his hand or is that Bob just simply saying hello? Yeah. All right. Altrex is the closest. Sermon on the Mount, at least part of it. Tying all denominations but Quaker and Knots. Yes. <laughs> and Mennonite. <laughs> Kessel wasn't even here and she already knows. Sermon on the Mount. Bonger says Sermon on the Mount, plain. Yeah, it's kind of a collection of teachings. Quakers do make good oatmeal. That's for sure, Bob. So if you remember, Ongerth was talking about the whole concept of turning the other cheek, giving to those who ask. He used Dietrich Bonhoeffer as an example of someone who had a radical change from saying, oh, it all has to be one way to later in life. He's like, I don't know if I can live by this. And that's when Ongerth started talking about the context of what's going on here. And so we have to remember that he was addressing the Pharisees. He was addressing uh, teachers of the law. Hold on just a second. Hey, Rib, I don't know if you know it or not, but your mic is picking up. Uh, I'm sorry. Background noise. No, me, you're good. Uh, me up. So um, last week, Ongerth was talking about uh, how Jesus, when he was addressing, he was addressing a crowd of people who were very works-based. Um, we were talking about like the Pharisees and stuff like that. And so what we need to understand here is that Jesus was setting a huge standard that was that is basically impossible to live by because he was talking to uh, a works-based group of people. And we all know that as Christians, our faith is is based upon, well, our, how do I say that? I hate using the word religion. Our beliefs are based on faith and faith in God and that we can't, our works and our, our, our golden stars, our brownie points is not what's important here. It's our relationship with Christ, our relationship with God, and with Christ being our advocate. So with that, we're going to continue where Ongerth left off. Can I have someone read for me Luke chapter 6, verses 39 and 42? Someone start us off. I'll do it. How do you feel about... Oh, go ahead. Uh, he also told a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out that is in... Uh, take out the speck that is in your eye... When you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck that is out of your brother. Uh, to take the speck that is in your brother's eye. Perfect. 
So what we have starting off here is we have this whole concept of the blind leading the blind. And um, so there's a couple cross references with this that I wanted to read. One of them is from Matthew 10, 24. When we're we talking about uh, the disciple and their teacher. So like in Matthew 10, 24, it says a disciple is not above his teacher, nor is a servant above his master. That uh, kind of ties in with these verses. Also, if we look at John 13, uh, in verse 16, he basically says the same thing. Truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And then we see the same thing in John 15, where he says, remember the words I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. They, so why is he bringing this up, I guess, is the question that, we, that I'm going to present to you guys. Um, this, ho this whole analogy of the blind leading the blind um, if you remember, if we jump back just a little bit before where Ongerth left off, it was about judging others in verses 37 and 38. He says, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. And, you know, we it's kind of a joke, but it's, it's a joke because it's true. We jokingly say that's like the most quoted verse in the Bible. And it is. It's more quoted than like John 3.16 or any of those other verses. And it's quoted by people all the time as an excuse for... Um, I can do whatever I want to do without any accountability, whether it doesn't matter what my moral ethics are, how well they align with what scripture says. If you judge me, then you'll be judged. And what that is actually trying to tie together here is this whole concept of do not judge. other. It's the whole idea of the blind leading the blind. What, what Jesus is trying to point out here isn't a don't judge people. What Jesus is trying to point out here is hypocrisy. And the reason why we're not supposed to judge other people is because we ourselves will be condemned or the same measure that we use against others will be used against ourselves. So like, for example, there's, there's scripture where like the apostle Paul made it very clearly that there was a man who was sleeping with his, you know, his father's wife. And he said, you need to get that man out, you know? So Paul obviously was making a judgment right there. He could have been like, oh, you can live however you want, you know, but as you're, we're all one family body of Christ and stuff like that. But, you know, Paul is very clear when he's writing to the Church of Corinthians or any other church for that matter. You were doing this. You shouldn't have been doing this or you did this and God bless you for this. You know, like I pray for you because my heart goes out to you. You know, that was just kind of how Paul was. He was very straight to the point. He didn't really care too much about hurting people's feelings. Um. And, like what, and likewise, what we see here is uh, basically Jesus saying he goes straight from, you know, judge not lest you be judged to then using this analogy of blind leading the blind. And so a uh, so quick question for you guys. In this analogy that he's giving, who are these blind people? Who would you say are the blind? Uh, well, the the blind uh, kind of refers to everyone uh, who is well, not doing spiritually well. As far as the blind leading the blind, though, the leaders are the, the spiritual leaders at the time, specifically the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or groups of them, uh, right. who aren't really doing well and are putting yokes on other people, effectively trying to get other people to do things um, to be righteous. Without mm -hmm. doing the same things themselves. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Ongerth is giving me way too much credit here. No, I, this isn't really actually a trick question. Maybe Ongerth or Scribe could turn it into a trick question, but I really genuinely wanted to know from you guys. Um, and a lot of commentaries agree with what Dodge is saying and uh, Bob right here. And basically, what he says, Bob wrote basically the Pharisees because the Pharisees, they were, they were blind. Uh, the hardness of their hearts blind them. Uh, I'm just going to read real quickly. Kessa says here, let's see, see Kessa wrote uh, from Matthew 15, verse 12, Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And he answered, Every plant that my father has not planted will be rooted up. 
let them alone that let them alone they are blind guides and if the blind lead the blind both will fall into a pit you know when i was studying this i re- remember the blind leading the blind and they'll both fall into a pit and i for some reason did not look up the cross reference for that i should have googled that that's excellent i appreciate that Kess. um so the word for blind here is actually uh uh, it's a uh, T Y P H L O S is the uh, if you translate the Greek to English, I believe that's Tiflos or Typhlos, Typhlos, something to that nature. But it doesn't refer to specifically. Yes, yep, it doesn't. So that's the word that's used for blind in this, and it does not specifically mean uh, physical blindness, but it can also uh, refer to. Well, uh, Wings Scribe said interesting. So before I continue on with my definition, I want to know why Wings thinks that's interesting. Stupid reasons. Carry on. Okay. So Tiflos actually can mean physical blindness, but it can also mean mental blindness, which I thought was interesting because like when you think of, like I was like, okay, what would be, that's that's literally what Strong's Concordance, cannot talk. That's literally what Strong's Concordance said was it can be physical blindness or mental blindness. And I'm like, okay, well, what is mental blindness? How would you guys define someone being mentally blind? <laughs> Scribe says me when I have to be at work early. Yeah. No self-awareness. I like it. Definitely. Longer says, me, keeps making bad decisions. Also me, I don't understand why bad things keep happening to me. Forward slash, backward slash, mental blindness. (laughs) Bob says, Apple employees, when I try to convince them that my battery isn't working right. (laughs) Funny. Ooh, scribe's taking it deep now. Either willful or unintentional ignorance. Ongerth replying to Bob saying, hard facts right here. It's true. But I will not get in an Apple and Android war. Um... Hold on, I'm waiting for you to finish typing. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to focus because I actually am very passionate about that topic and we're not here to discuss your uh, tech wars. All right. So, Scribe's definition is actually, I think, well, I mean, it's got four likes, obviously. So, if this was Reddit, it would have to be truth, right? So, (laughs) but um, no, basically, like when when you research it, like it's uh, just refusing to believe the truth, or, and like he said, either willfully or unintentional ignorance. So, uh, Yeah, I don't think there's anything left to say about that. Um, did you guys want to add anything, or do you want me to go ahead and keep going to verse 40? <laughs> yes. Scribe says, read it, the current day emblem of subjective truth. Dang it, I shouldn't have said it. All right, let's get back on topic. Let's move on to verse 4, okay? This is going down a rabbit hole fast. All right, so in verse 4, it says here, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. 
uh, in the King James Version, it says that the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. And I really like that the ESV trains it, translates it to fully trained. Because the problem with the word perfect is then we get this idea of that we're and perfect in this sense is not talking about being sinless. It's talking about a finished product, like when a craftsman is happy with their work. Um, you know, like if you're a carpenter and you finish building something, you make this really cool wooden, I don't know, a wooden tractor if you're into woodwork or something like that, a wood John Deere tractor, and you're really happy with it, and you put it on your shelf and you look at it. It's that kind of perfect. Not the, oh, I'm, I'm sinless, I'm above reproach. Um, Let's see here. I just saw this message from Kessa. I've read that the unique sign of the Messiah that he would open. See, I read that the unique sign of the Messiah that he would open the eyes of the blind, both physically and spiritually. None of the prophets did that miracle. It was reserved for him. Do you remember where you read that, Kess? That's interesting. It might have been a sermon. It was a okay. long time ago. Okay. Very interesting. So when Jesus is saying a disciple is not above his master, he's pointing that he's also pointing out here kind of a, a tit for tat, I guess you could say a give and take here. Like what we've got here is we've got the Pharisees, you know, versus and their teachings versus Christ and his teachings. And when he's saying here, the disciple is not above his master, he's pointing out that those who follow the Pharisees, or the teachers of the law, they'll become basically like a product of the Pharisees. They're not going to be any better than the Pharisees because they're, they can't be better than their master, you know, where likewise, the followers of Christ, the disciples of Christ, they won't become better than their, than Christ, you know, but we become a product of Christ's teachings. Um, you know, he is the potter and we are the clay. So we basically, he, as we, those that we allow to disciple us, shape us in a sense. Um, any questions with that before we move on to the next verse? Anything you guys like to add to verse 40 before we move on to 41? Someone's typing, so we'll just give them just a sec. It's an interesting thought from Kess. It's one I really have to think about, but it's kind of interesting that in... I think it's in... Someone else might have to help me out. I think it's in Matthew, where Jesus is, has, been, has been preaching, and then his... Uh, some disciples of... of John, John the baptizer, come to him and ask him, it's like, hey, John's just wanting to know, he's in prison, he's wanting to know, are you the guy we're waiting for, or should we look for somebody else? And Jesus responds, he says, tell what you've seen and heard. He says, the, uh, tell the miracle of work, and he specifically mentions that the blind see. Mm -hmm. yep. I'd never thought about that. And just doing a quick search, there's never another mention of the blind receiving sight as a miracle, it's prophesied about in, in several of the prophets, but it's never mentioned right. as anything that was actively done until the coming of Jesus. Hmm. I never picked up on that. That's awesome. Well, thank you. I, I, uh, you know, when you're leading, you, you get so like tunnel vision that you, that's why I need you guys to kind of come in here and, share because not only does it help me out and kind of help relax the situation on my end but it also is makes everything way more informative and way more uh deep so thank you Kess, and thank you for sharing that and thank you subscribe i appreciate it uh anything else you guys have to add before we move on all right I assume by science, the answer is no. So we're going to go to verse 41 here, which says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? 
Um, this is also can be cross-referenced with Matthew 7, chapter 7, verses 4, which says, How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? Um, I think this analogy is one of the most unforgettable analogies from some of Jesus' teachings. Like, I remember even as a kid, when I first heard this, uh, that... Oh, so for people who are listening, Matthew chapter 11, 1 through 6 was when John's question has John's question and Jesus' answer that scribe is referring to. So if we look back at uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 41, and Matthew 7, verses 4, this analogy here, it's, it, you know, I was when I was researching this, I came across something interesting because I remember as a kid first hearing that, and I just thought it was so strange, this whole concept of, a log being in someone's eye and then walking around with a, like a log sticking out of their eye. It just seems so strange. But according to uh, McLaren's exposition commentary, when I was reading uh, different commentaries on this particular passage, they said that this is actually a very common imagery used in rabbinical or rabbi teachings or writings. So that even though it was kind of, un, you know, even as a, an Ameri American kid, you know, hearing people talk about in the sermon about a log in your own eye, even though to us that's like, whoa, that's kind of far out there. Like this is actually a pretty common, I guess you could say colloquialism or term. I'm not sure what the exact word is that. So it's, thank you. Cause it says, so it's like an expression or idiom. I believe so based upon what I was writing, that this analogy wasn't quite as like, uh, wing scribe says an extreme one to be sure. Yeah, definitely. It just, you know, like as a kid, I just remember hearing that and thinking like, here's this guy walking around with a log in his eye. It's just really weird. But according to what I read, that actually is a, was a popular analogy among uh, rabbinical teaching. So, I don't know. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Either way, it still makes a lasting impression. So then my question for you guys, and this ties into what uh, Rib was saying. when she, I, I, I was kind of waiting to hear this word. Let's see, Kessa says, for Americans... Anvil squash, and then for Jews, optical log jam. I missed the joke. I'm sorry. I'm sure someone here gets it, and I don't. I apologize. But, um, yeah, so Rib was talking here about, uh, So, sorry, I'm, let me back up here just a second. So Rib was talking, she said something here that uh, I noticed uh, talking about self-awareness or awareness. And that was one of my questions I actually had for you guys when we talk about, so, you know, with, Jesus makes it very clear about make sure to remove the log from your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. But how do we gain that self-awareness how do we remove i mean we we can't remove a log from our eye if we can't see that log if we don't know it's there unless someone comes out and points it out to us like how as christians how as human beings for that matter can we obtain a self-awareness or have a realistic vision of ourselves because at least for me i often have a very unrealistic vision of ourselves of myself what can we do to help us be more self-aware so that we can take the log from our own eye. Do you guys have any suggestions? Because it's really easy. It's really easy to find fault in others, to find the speck in other people's eyes. But how are we able to even take the log out of our own eyes if we don't even know we have it? Any takers? All right. Well, no one's typing. So, um, someone is typing. All right. Go for it, Rib.
waiting for some insight here. So Rib says, so I think in our criticism, it'll point out our own faults. Being a parent, I notice it's pretty easily, I notice it pretty easily that the things that I have qualms about with my children is often because it's my own problem that they've inherited from just being my child. And she got the okay and the thumbs up on that like right away. So we have definitely have some parents in the house, that is for sure. But yeah, I personally am not a parent, but it scares me how much I get mad at some of the things that my family members do. And then I, when I actually stop to think about it, I'm like, wow, I actually do that very same thing. And I am married and that helped a lot having a wife telling me, uh, you're behaving like so-and-so and yeah. So there's, there's that accountability going for me in that situation, but I'm sure with parents and with children, Children are very quick to point out hypocrisy, so I've been told. Kess is typing something. So Kess says, self-awareness, procurement tactic number one, get married. Self-awareness, procurement tactic number two, have kids. <laughs> I think that's that's very safe. <laughs> a very safe thing to say there. It's very true. So I think the, because this is really hard for me. I think the the only way I can really tie this in, or the best way I can think of, of coming up for an answer for this question that I had was if we just keep reading the passage to what they jump into next. See, like, like I said, it's really easy for us to have an unrealistic vision of ourselves. Um, but I think one of the things that we can be watching for besides getting married and having kids. And she says, yeah, all single, these singles get off scot-free. And it's funny that you say that because uh, I'm hoping that with what we're talking about next, this will kind of help singles out. You know, there, we always need accountability. And so that's why it's important that we involve ourselves in church and other Christians and stuff like that. But I think it's really important that we look at the kind of fruit that we are producing, which ties us in to our next verses. So can I have someone read Luke chapter 6, verses 43 and 45? Would you like a robot reading? Sure. Sure. I don't care. <laughs> Robots are people All right, too. I'll read. <laughs> For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. So, thank you. So, um, just right off the bat here, we are given an analogy for, or in here we have an analogy of people's desires or where their heart is, which is represented by the root of the plant itself and their outward actions are represented by the fruit. I think one of the, you know, when I was, one of the biggest questions that I had while I was studying this is, well, you know, what fruit are they talking about? What kind of fruit should they be producing? And, you know, I th that's kind of a tough question because when we talk about the kind of fruit they produce, that really boils down to, you know, like, like, like when we say a good tree bears good fruit. Okay. Well, what constitutes as being good fruit was my question at least. Um, and that kind of, I kind of came across a passage of scripture that I'd like to share because I think it kind of helps with that. And it's 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. So I'm just going to really quickly read those verses here about, um, it's, so Peter is talking here about uh, confirming our calling. And right here is, I'll just go ahead and read it and see what you guys think of it. So when it comes to producing fruit, this is what stood out to me. 
For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours, Sorry, I lost my place. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't end there because I thought this next, I wanted to include verse nine because of this reason. I thought it was a good, like, like this is what it will be like if you do these things. And then here's what happens to those who don't do those things. So in verse nine, it says, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory, I guess you could say, because he gives literally like the ingredients for being fruitful in those verses. Um, so before I go on with that, anything else you guys like to add with that? Or anything you guys get out of that, or any questions, concerns, or rebuttals? Kiss is typing. Yeah, definitely. Because it says that's a recipe for an excruciating amount of character development. That is true. But. Peter makes it very clear that if we strive for those things, that we'll be, it will keep us from being ineffective and unfruitful in our knowledge for, for the Lord Jesus Christ. But yeah, excruciating is a good word. <laughs> Anything else, guys? So another thing I'd like to point out, oh, sorry, Kess is typing. Go ahead, Kess. Oh, you're welcome. So another thing that uh, points out to me here when, we, when we're talking about, one of the things that I guess you could say stood out to me based on past teachings as well as uh, just pondering these verses, if we go to, if we, when, we're, when Jesus is talking here about a good tree producing good fruit and a bad tree producing bad fruit. I think it would be, I think it's important to reference, to make a reference to John 15 verses four through five. Cause it says here that if you abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you on the shoe abide in me. For I am the vine and you are the branches and whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So when it comes to two things I see here. One, we have Peter giving us ingredients for bearing good fruit, whatever that might be for your life, because I can't say there's a one-size-fits-all for, because, it, you know, what if you don't have the spiritual gift of discipleship or hospitality or something like that? You know, maybe, maybe you're a sociopath and you can't be hospitable but you're really good at interpreting scripture or something. I don't know. But so, so like the thing about what, what fruits, that was always something that was tough with me. But I know that if we follow Peter's advice here, I'll be unfruit. I'll be, I will not, sorry, I will not be ineffective or unfruitful, but I also know that it's impossible for me to bear good fruit without Christ. And that's reinstated here. John reinstates that here in chapter 15. Um, anything else you guys would like to add before we jump to verse 45. Anything else? All right, let's keep on rolling then. So in verse 45, if you'll hang tight with me here. So it talks about a good person out of the good treasures of his heart produces good person out of his evil treasures produces evil for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And this can be, you know, this is also can be cross-referenced with Matthew's writings 
where if we look at um, Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, what talks about the treasures of the heart it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth, moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, I think what's important here when we look at verses 30. Yeah. When we're looking at verses 45, what's important here is that we need to know what the tr what where our treasure is. Sorry, let me rephrase this. To know where our treasure is, we need to look at the desires of our heart. And then we, it's also why it's super important if we read in Proverbs 4, verses 23, that we need to guard our hearts. You know, for if we look at... Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your hearts with all vigilance, for it is the wellspring of life. So, basically, the, the point I was trying to get at is that you can, if you want to know where someone's heart is, just let them talk for five minutes. <laughs> Long story short. Um, you guys didn't have any comments about those verses? Any questions, concerns, things you'd like to add? Kiss typing. So Kess says, words are important, but actions speak louder than words. Some people claim one set of values but live another, especially in church, and they can be dangerous. That is absolutely true. I'm glad that you clarified that. Sometimes while I'm typing up these outlines, it's easy, it's easy to either sugarcoat it or just brush through it because I have to finish this outline. But no, you're absolutely right. It's, words are one thing, but actions do speak louder. Bob is typing. Uh, Bob says another verse that might be relevant is John 15, chapter 15, verses 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. That is true, too. That's excellent. Excellent observation there, Bob. So not only will we, if we pray and try to be fruitful and do what it takes to be fruitful and grow in our knowledge of Christ, but we'll also, as he prunes us, we'll bear even more fruit. Then Altrex says, you mentioned about storing up treasures in heaven. How about Colossians 3 verses, chapter 3 verses 4 and 1? Let's take a look at it. Give me just a second there. I'll be right with you. Colossians chapter 3. Hold on, what was it? Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. That is beautiful. Excellent reference there. Uh, Kessa says, I heard a story about a minister who visited one of his uh, parishioners. I don't actually know what that is. 
After the mother of the household sold everyone in the parlor, she turned to her daughter and said, bring me that big book I've, I'm always looking at, dear. Vera came back with the Sears catalog. Is that a true story? Did you read that in Reader's Digest? Uh, I don't know where I heard that. It was a long time ago, but the joke is that the mom meant the Bible, right. but the daughter just took her literally. <laughs> right. That's funny. All right. Uh, anything you guys want to add, or, or do you guys want to keep on rolling forward? It's actually funny that you bring that up, Kes, because, uh, um, oh, well, we're getting off topic. Never mind. I do have a funny story later to, to that happened at work. Um, but anyway, uh, let's go ahead and move on to Luke chapter six. Can I get someone, if someone's willing, would they please read verses 46 through 49? I got you. Awesome. Thanks, Unger. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came, uh, arose, and the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built on the ground without any foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of the house was great. Thank you. So here we have another completely unforgettable analogy, made even more unforgettable by the song, uh, The Wise Man Built His House Upon the Rock. So my question for you guys is, what does the foundation of the house represent? <laughs> Without a foundation, things go really bad. Yeah, that's true. Things can look like they're fine without a foundation until something uh, happens or gets used at all. Or has to deal with uh, even a moderate amount of wear. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyone who works in construction knows that. As soon as you start seeing that crack in that concrete, you're like, oh, that ain't good. So because it says the rock and the rock was, let's see, and that rock was Christ. And she's quoting from Paul. Do you remember where Paul says that? Let me go look it up so I look like I know what I'm doing. And Anger said his house upon the rock. Oh, his house upon the rock. Yep. Song. So if you look at these verses, there's a couple things. You know, I've heard this. I, I know the song by heart, and I've heard the story over and over and over. But there's a couple things here that kind of stood out to me when I read through this again uh and i will point them out to you one of the things that really stood out to me here is where it says uh everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them i will show you what he is like he is like a man who who has built his house and who's dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock as soon as jesus is kind of saying like this isn't cryptic as cryptic as like say revelations jesus is making it clear like you say, Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I tell you. You know, it's um, like if we look at, I think it's John 14 verses 15. Hold on here. Just let me check. 
Yeah, in John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You know, if you love me, then you're going to obey what I tell you. And he's basically saying the same thing here. He's saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them, I'll show you what he's like. So he's basically saying, okay, here's my analogy. Like this isn't this, you know, so this is pretty, pretty self-explanatory. He's saying that if you obey my words, it's like you built your house on a foundation. So the foundation here is the word of God. But Christ is also, but here's the thing that's interesting. So like he does also use, if, uh, notice that he uses the word rock here. And like that ties in with what Kessa says about when Paul said that, and that rock was Christ. So that ties in there. But then one thing that never really stood out to me until I recently reread this again, is it said, uh, was the words dug deep. And it's because like when I was in this is that he dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. Because like when I was in, when I was a little kid and like we were in Sunday school and the teacher was showing like the little flannel, had the little flannel panel or whatever, or was showing like little pictures, little flashcards that while telling a story and stuff, I always remember this clear image of like, there was this raging storm with this like rocky cliff, you know, like something out of, I don't know, like Moby Dick or Jaws or something where you had like that rocky, uh, like, cliff and then on top of the cliff was this big rock and then the house just kind of sat on it and then you had this sandy shore and someone put their house their little hut on that and the sands you know broke away and the floods came in and tore the house down so i always kind of had this image of this house just sitting on this rock but it doesn't but one of the things that stuck out to me here is that it says that he dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock so this guy that he's using as an analogy, he had to put work into this. He wasn't just like, oh, here's a rock. I'm going to put my house on No, he had to dig deep into the ground until he hit rock. And that's where he laid his foundation. So that was one thing that really stuck out to me is because as someone who's had to dig a lot, digging is really hard work. It's not very fun. <laughs> and so hitting bedrock is hard. That's very hard. So that was just... An insight that was when I was reading over this was like, oh, I never really paid attention to the fact that he actually had to dig. But um, I don't know, it just kind of ties in with like uh, when Jesus talks about how things are hidden. So for those who are seeking them, I can't actually remember exactly off the top of my head. But I don't want to misquote there, so forget that. Um, but yeah. Anything you guys want to add to that? About this whole analogy? I wish digging was as easy as it is as they make it look in Minecraft. That'd make life so much easier. So Kessa says here, during an earthquake, the ground can act like a liquid and buildings will sink in. But if the foundations are sunk into the bedrock, the buildings have a better chance of surviving a quake. In San Francisco, they now dig deep down and bolt the foundation to bedrock. Well, there you go. can't have a more modern day analogy of one of Christ's analogies. So I just think it's important for us to know that like remember Jesus, remember we were kind of circling back around to the beginning of the topic. Remember we were talking about who was Jesus addressing here? And he was addressing most commentaries, a lot of you guys also from previous lessons and stuff talked about how Jesus was addressing the Pharisees here and other works-based religious people. And I think one of the important things that he were, we need to pay attention to here is that when Jesus says, you know, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments, we have to make sure that we understand it's not the obeying of his commandments is that what saves us. It's that if we look at James chapter 2, verse 17, it says that faith without works is dead. 
So sure, our salvation isn't based upon works, but our works are a sign of our love for Christ. Because, like I said, without faith, I mean, faith without works is dead. Is there anything else you guys would like to add? Any questions, concerns, comments? Is typing? It says, sir, I'm concerned the study might end on time. Yeah, well, I try to be a lot better about that. I'm getting, getting there. I went from a two and a half hour long session to now almost an hour session. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. Anything else you guys want to discuss or talk about? If not, we can go ahead and go to prayer. But please speak up. Kess is typing, so we'll see what she has to say. And then if no one has anything else to say after that, then we'll uh, end with prayer requests. So Kess says, life has a way of revealing that our what our foundations are. We may think that we are living for Christ until we lose something that turns out to have been our foundation, even if we didn't realize it at the time. I think it was Lewis who said that only under torture do we discover the truth. Oof. That's so true that it actually scares me. <laughs> oh, man. Those are some powerful words. Those are also some extremely terrifying words. Because <laughs> I've, yeah. Anyone who's been in the faith knows exactly what Lewis is talking about there. Hard time, Rib says, hard times reveal the dross. I'm actually going to have to look, that, look up what that word means because I don't know what dross means. You educated people. It's... When metal is refined, especially precious metals, the impurities will float to the top. That's the dross, and they're skimmed off. Awesome. Thank you so much. You guys were great tonight. I appreciate everyone's attentiveness and interaction. Um, I guess we can go ahead and start with prayer requests, if you guys are interested. Kess is typing. We'll see what Kess has to say, and then after that, we can... You guys can start typing out your prayer requests. Also, I guess since we're taking prayer requests, if this is where you cut the recording, go for it. I'm not sure exactly how football decides to cut the recording, but... I 
All right, so 